opiates, opioids, and the problems they cause are in the headlines daily, but this drug's use actually started thousands of years ago. In this week's installment, we bring our series up to date with an exploration of the current opioid crisis featuring guest commentator from addiction specialist Shelley Sprague and authors David Sheff and San Canonis. And now DrDrew.com presents The History of Opium. Part 11, The Current Opioid Crisis. Despite the fact the United States has weathered several drug epidemics fueled by narcotics derived from the opium poppy, this country finds itself presently in the middle of yet another major opioid crisis. This one differs from previous episodes in that it is the largest. It's similar in that it can trace its origins to the same genesis as the others, iatrogenesis, physicians. Of course, unintended, the medical community is largely responsible for the current situation. And of course, there were many accomplices, drug manufacturers, drug distributors, pharmacies. All of these groups have acted irresponsibly to create a perpetual cycle of addiction. And each must recognize its contributions, take responsibility, make changes, and learn from history in order to prevent it from happening yet again. Thousands upon thousands of preventable deaths can be attributed to opiates and opioids every year. These tragic outcomes affect all ages, races, and socioeconomic groups. There will always be a new, stronger, faster-acting addictive drug on the horizon. So unless a comprehensive strategy that clamps down on the way we are prescribing these drugs is put in place, there will continue to be further abuse. Reform, accountability, actions are imperative. Countless lives will continue to be destroyed, resulting in unnecessary illness, misery, and death. I personally watched this present opioid epidemic unfold. Uh, I was alarmed. I made noise about it. I was told I was old-fashioned and out of date because pain control was coming into a new modern era. And of course, my patients uh, loved that idea. Unfortunately, it resulted in horrible morbidity and mortality. The history we must look at now is the forces that came into place to put pain as a fifth vital sign, to make control of pain the patient's issue rather than the physician's responsibility. Here's where it started. Emboldened by unsubstantiated and unscientific claims about opiates, this was published in the New England Journal, Porter and Jick Letter, and in the journal Pain, Portnoy and Foley, 1986, drug companies saw an opportunity. David Sheff? I think it's just appalling that, uh, you know, we're in this position, the current opioid problem is here because, you know, of, of, you know, really unscrupulous behavior on the part of specifically the pharmaceutical companies. I don't hold... There, there are some bad eggs in terms of physicians, doctors who are over-prescribing and have over-prescribed, and it's been you know, very advantageous. They've made a lot of money. But part of the reason that doctors over-prescribed is because they were given uh, bad information uh, by some of the drug companies that was pushing that were pushing you know, some of these opioids. And you know, there's been so much attention to uh, Purdue Pharmaceutical Company. There's been all this documentation that they were actively telling doctors that these medications were not addictive, they were safe, um, they were pushing doctors, giving all sorts of incentives for them to prescribe more and more and more. Uh, and now we have just seen, you know, sort of the cynicism behind some of this. There's some memos that have been coming out that have shown things that are almost impossible to believe. You know, somebody uh, in the Sackler family, the Purdue family, uh, writing to someone else saying, uh, you know, let's create, let's put out these medications to help people who become addicted because then we'll be getting profits on both sides, addicting people, getting them off addiction. I mean, it's unbelievable and uh, it's, it's unfathomable to me how people in those positions can sleep at night. In 1952, brothers Mortimer and Raymond Sackler, both psychiatrists, purchased a drug company called Purdue Frederick. The main product at the time was a medicinal tonic called Gray's Glycerin. Under the brothers' ownership, the company branched out and began to sell products of a less dubious nature, including laxatives and antiseptics. The third Sackler brother, Arthur, also a psychiatrist, helped financially with the purchase of the drug company, but was primarily busy working at an advertising company. Arthur, who by all account was possessed by a brilliant mind, honed his marketing and advertising skills while working on a campaign for a new drug called Valium. This was a considerable challenge because another drug called Librium dominated the sedative market at the time. Valium was of a very similar nature chemically. Arthur's acumen for advertising materialized when Valium became the first drug to reach $100 million sales mark, but Arthur Sackler was just getting started. 
Arthur's keen insight told him that pain medication was the future, so in 1984, Purdue Frederick reformulated an old cancer drug into a time-released version and brought MS content, morphine sulfate continuous, to the market. Primarily used for cancer pain and very effective for con- cancer pain, sales skyrocketed to hundreds of millions of dollars in sales. This solidified the company's success in the growing pharmaceutical industry. At the end of the 80s, and with a patent for MS Cotton about to expire, Purdue went to work to develop the next generation of pain medication. Now, mind you, at this point, cancer pain was a major issue that was being addressed, not chronic pain and not acute pain. Acute pain was well treated with morphine and Demerol and other products at the time. Cancer pain was being increasingly well treated by things like MS Contin. But now the issue of chronic pain, which is a different syndrome, emerged. Now, a definition of pain emerged, this published by Margot McCaffrey, an American nurse in 1968. Quote, pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, existing whenever and wherever the person says it does. That became the organizing principle of pain management. Now, despite the nation's history with physician-facilitated addiction, this definition of pain was the standard and would conceptualize the treatment of pain for decades. What eventually happened is pain control is whatever patient says it is. Now, well-intentioned and spoken by someone who is considered a pioneer in the field of pain management nursing, the definition set the tone for generations of clinicians including those who had not been adequately trained in pain management and certainly no training in addiction. And unfortunately, the characterization was predominant during the era that ushered our problem in. By the time OxyContin came to market in 1996, advertising genius, elder brother, Sackler, Arthur, had been dead for nearly a decade. The die, if you will, however, had been cast and Purdue continued on its trajectory. With the development of a new controlled release formula of the existing drug OxyCodone, now OxyContin, the company was poised to become a juggernaut. Sam Quinones? Yeah, the FDA asked to be put or required to be put on this warning label, wording to the effect that if you were to take this pill, which contained a certain amount of uh, oxycodone wrapped in a, in a time-release formula of, of Purdue Pharma's design, and you were to crush that up, that you could uh, then abuse it and, and that you might, you might die and this kind of thing. And what that ended up being was really just a roadmap for how you would abuse the drug. Though originally intended for cancer pain, it was eventually determined that OxyContin should be marketed and used to treat chronic, non-malignant cancer pain. This is where we got into trouble. Because there was no science to suggest that chronic pain got better or was improved with any opiate. In fact, it gets worse. It should come as no surprise that the success of the strategy coincided with the beginning of our opioid crisis. Shelley Sprague? In the opiate crisis, I feel like they have lacked the ability to get educated around uh, substance abuse adequately and have been given opportunities to write prescriptions that are dangerous to a certain percentage of the population and them not knowing the difference between these populations has caused quite a bit of problems. I don't scapegoat them completely, but I do think that if you are a physician, that at this point you need to be looking at how to prescribe and what's appropriate and that there are other alternatives besides oxycodone and, you know, heavy narcotics for people and getting an education around how long people need to be taking them and what to look for when people are addicted and are no longer utilizing the substance for what it was intended for. Several things occurred in the mid-1990s that would further bolster Purdue's efforts. For starters, patient groups, academic journals, and the federal government asserted that doctors weren't doing enough to alleviate pain. Around this time, pain scales were introduced, the discipline of pain management emerged, The ubiquitous smiley face charts that rate pain on a 1 to 10 scale, still around. And in his keynote address at the annual conference of the American Pain Society, Dr. James Campbell, a neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins University and the society president, called for the medical community to consider pain, quote, the fifth vital sign and treat it accordingly. Think about that. As important as your blood pressure or pulse. You could have no pulse and the doctor is supposed to concern himself or herself with pain. These developments resulted in prevailing attitude that doctors should endeavor not only to reduce pain, but to eliminate it completely. The American Pain Society trademarked the slogan, Pain, the Fifth Vital Sign, and received funding from Purdue. 
during Campbell's presidency. The demand to eradicate pain completely was advanced in 1998 when a memo from the Veterans Health Administration suggested, quote, a comprehensive pain assessment and prompt intervention upon a patient's indication of four or greater on the pain sale. A four is like when you get a bruise. That same year, the Federation of State Medical Boards released a policy reassuring doctors that they would not face regulatory action for prescribing even large amounts of narcotics, provided it was in the course of treating pain. The Joint Commission, who was responsible for accreditation of healthcare organizations, supported this and made it a part of their regulatory reviews. All of these developments dovetailed nicely with Purdue's desire to increase sales. Unfortunately, their zeal to flood the market outweighed any concern. Even before its release, Purdue and its marketing company, Abbott Laboratories, ignored scientific evidence which suggested that this was highly addictive. It stated that the drug often fell short of providing the 12 hours relief that it promised. People therefore used more. And despite their awareness of the drug's pitfalls and shortcomings, Purdue and Abbott went full steam ahead with an aggressive marketing campaign. Fearing that they would face resistance from physicians, they marketed OxyContin as having a reduced risk for addiction, citing scant and questionable evidence provided by Portnoy, Foley, Porter, Jick. Purdue undertook a systematic effort to downplay the drug's addiction qualities and endeavored to win over members of the medical community. Between 1996, the year it was released, and 2001, thousands of physicians, pharmacists, and nurses were treated to all-expense-paid symposiums in California and Arizona to tout the efficacy of these drugs. OxyContin reached $40 million in sales in 1996, but hit over $1 billion in 2000. The sales force grew, and so did the list of potential targets, general practitioners, dentists, OBGYNs. Peddling information that lacked scientific support, sales reps, the crusaders, cajoled doctors into prescribing OxyContin by often treating them to lunches and incentives. Though physicians deny that these ploys affect prescribing practices, studies suggest otherwise. Sales reps who were successful with the beneficiaries of large cash bonuses and sometimes a royal title. Sales were further increased by the use of sophisticated marketing data that identified the highest and lowest prescribers in a given area. The relentless pursuit resulted in billions of dollars worth of sales and an ever-growing population of people who were addicted to a drug that was being prescribed to them by someone they trusted. The addictive properties of OxyContin were continually minimized and doctors were told to increase the dosage amount if the effects wore off. After all, addiction in the setting of pain, according to Dr. Portnoy, did not exist. And they even questioned whether there was such a thing as addiction if it was under properly titrated influence of the physician. It was crazy. The psychologist named Stephen Pasek, who was a disciple of Dr. Portnoy and the pain management expert, so-called, he characterized the period, quote, it had all the markings of a religious movement at the time. It had the kind of spirit to it. In other words, if you question these doctors' intent to treat pain, you were literally questioning some sort of uh, almost a religious belief system. Even as the epidemic worsened, the Joint Commission published a guide in 2003, sponsored by Purdue, stating, quote, some clinicians have inaccurate and exaggerated concerns about addiction, tolerance, and the risk of death. And astonishingly, quote, this attitude prevails despite the fact that there is no evidence that addiction is a significant issue when persons are given opioids for pain control. The Joint Commission. So if you didn't comply with that statement, you would not be accredited. Think about that. Predictably, the parties involved in creating this catastrophe all blame each other now. Some systems that were in place to check suspicious drug orders were routinely ignored because it was all about pain control. You were just trying to help the patient. Drug abusers found ways around safeguards, and they had at it. People sold their prescription pills on the street, inflated prices, purchasing less expensive heroin to support their habit. By 2004, OxyContin was the leading drug of abuse in the United States. 2007 was the first time that Purdue was forced to take some responsibility. The company and three of its executives pleaded guilty to criminal charges of misleading doctors and patients about the addictive properties of the drugs and misbranding it, quote, as an abuse-resistant drug. They were fined $635 million. The three Sackler brothers have all died, but their legacy endures, not only because of their association with Purdue Pharma and OxyContin, but also for their philanthropic efforts. Starting in the 1970s, they began to donate what has become millions of dollars to museums and cultural institutions. One of their most significant gifts was a $3.5 million donation to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1974. The endowment was used to construct the Sackler Wing, which houses the Temple of Dendur. The temple was given to the United States by Egypt in 1965, and according to the Met, was a dwelling in which rituals were enacted to nurture deities who would ensure the prosperity of the community. 
Surrounded by a dramatic sloping wall and windows and massive reflecting pool, the Temple of Dendur was recently the site of an anti-opiate protest led by famed photographer and former opiate addict Nan Golden. She, along with several dozen protesters, gathered in the Sackler Wing to call for cultural institutions to reject money from the Sackler family on the grounds of their connection with the addictive drugs. The group threw prescription bottles into the reflecting pool, and about 50 of the protesters laid down on the floor in a symbolic die-in. Afterwards, they were walked through the museum chanting, Sacklers lie, people die. Brilliant Arthur Sackler, who was induced into the Medical Advertising Hall of Fame in 1997, would not have missed the irony of the temple, whose very existence was meant to ensure the prosperity of the community, being used as a locale to protest the dangerous consequences of opiates. Admirably, Dr. Russell Portnoy, the early opiate champion, has amended his opinion quite a bit. In 2002, he said, quote, I gave innumerable lectures in the late 1980s and 90s about addiction that weren't true. And clearly, if I had any inkling of what I know now, then I would not have spoken the way that I spoke. It was clearly the wrong thing to do. I want to thank my guests, Shelley Sprague, David Sheff, and Sam Cunonius. Tune in next week as we look at the doctor's role in the opioid epidemic and why combining opiates and benzodiazepines is a deadly combination. I want to thank Michelle Poe and the staff of DrDrew.com for helping pull this series together, which you can read in its entirety at DrDrew.com. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.